everybody. Thank you so much for joining me. In case you haven't figured it out yet, I am Kay Thompson, a principal broker here at Best Real Estate Company. And this is the latest episode of the Best Real Estate Company's Friday Focus. I wanted to start off, and hopefully I'm going to do my very best to keep this one short today. I just have a few things, but I um, wanted to start off by um, giving some thanks to um, Gwen Ware, who reached out and let me know that she had listened to um, last week's podcast and that um, there were some, that, that my voice was muted in a couple of parts. Um, and as you know, I've stated before, I'm not really a technology person, so I uh, am still working through processes of how to make this podcast perfect. So thank you so much. Um, Gwen for letting me know that. And so what I'm going to try to do is spend a couple of minutes um, going back um, and uh, figuring out what those things were. I didn't get a chance to do that today that were cut off. And um, and then um, I did I did notice where the things were cut off, but I had already started working on today's podcast. So I'm going to go back and um, re-listen to it and then maybe send a shortened version of a video to you guys um, later in the week um, that just focuses on those topics. I might be able to edit that video in some way to add um, the voice back in, but I'm not really sure. So, uh, but thank you for uh, pointing that out. Uh, I do think, uh, I do know for a fact that one of the parts um, that went out a little bit was um, where I was talking about what was going on in, in our book how to have confidence and power in dealing with people by Liz Giblin. And um, we were on section four or section two, uh, chapter four last week. And uh, I really was telling you um, what the chapter was about, just kind of giving a synopsis um, of, of what um, the, uh, this particular chapter featured. And basically what it was talking about was um, how you can control the actions and attitudes of other people. And I had made um, some suggestions for things that you could do. The book actually has some suggestions in here uh, for things that you can do. Um, I gave, I told a story um, about how I had this situation with a real estate broker, um, or not, um, not a real estate broker, but a real estate attorney who had contacted me because um, she was representing a client that one of our agents was a real estate uh, professional for. And uh, she just kind of started the conversation very matter of fact and um, very antagonistic and was telling me what I needed to do in order to train and teach my agents and things of that nature. Um, and once I dug into the situation, I realized that the other side um, that was being uh, represented in the transaction uh, was being represented by another best agent. So for me, it was about more than just making sure that this agent um, on this side, let's just say the seller, um, was able to um, have things go the way that they needed, but I also had to look out for the best interest of the buyer as well. And uh, because the virus being represented by a best agent as, as well. And um, we were able to work the situation out. Ultimately, um, I did um, give the, 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 the attorney the same um, energy that she gave me at the onset of the phone call. And uh, basically... Um, a few years went by and she was doing business with the third best agent and made a mention to that agent that she wanted us to su support something that she was doing. Um, and, sh and so that uh, our agent says, well, hey, you know, reach out to Kay. She's, you know, into those, that kind of thing. And she might be willing to help. The um, attorney said, well, I don't think she likes me because we had this, you know, deal and, you know, um, it was a, we had a very contentious conversation. And so 
the agent came back and let me know that. And I reached out to her to let her know, well, yeah, you approached me with an antagonistic um, tone and that's how I received it. Um, and so that caused me to react um, a certain way. Um, and But these are real estate transactions that I don't take what's going on in the transactions personally. Um, I do recognize my role in the transaction. Um, and so, you know, my primary focus is to provide information and, and education and make sure that we can get our clients to their desired outcome. Um, so, you know, once the transaction was over, I, I went on with, you know, my life. I didn't sit and stew over, you know, whether or not me and this person were going to have um, um, a positive um, experience in the future once we came together to interact again. I just thought that would be natural, uh, but, but clearly it wasn't for her. And so we worked that out. And um, so that was one of the main things that I was talking about um, from there. And then um, um, the next chapter was chapter is, is what we should be discussing today, but I'm going to um, forgo it. Um, because I have a few other things that I wanted to talk about that were more real estate related, but, um, chapter five is how you can create a good first impression on other people. I think this is very important and I may, um, well, I'm looking forward to using this, um, chapter next week because we're going to talk about, um, build a rapport and, and things that you can do to get, uh, new leads. A lot of people, um, are going to come to me as we near the end of the year to ask me that very question because um, typically we have a, a little bit less activity during the holiday season than we do um, in other time periods because people are shopping for Christmas and what have you. And so we are going to um, talk a little bit about that and some things that we can do to, um, yeah, that's the right one. Some things that we can do to uh, survive the holiday season, um, to still keep working um, while everybody else is, um, you know, participating in um, the, 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 the uh, um, Christmas and Hanukkah and all the things. Um, and so, um, with that being said, I wanted to go ahead and jump right in to our news um, uh, this for this week. I'm not sure if any of you guys um, saw um, the uh, any real estate news in the last couple of um, days, but I have a few um, things that I think are interesting that we're going to talk uh, that I'm going to share with you. Uh, I don't know if I can, I'm going to try sharing my screen. Yeah. I don't know if it's going to, um, I don't know if it's going to, okay, maybe I can share a window. I think this thing is in my face at the moment. <laughs> so I'm going to probably try moving it out of the way. Okay, yes. Yeah, so it's, I'm not really sure it's going to let me share the screen the way I want to. Um, I'm using two different um, web browsers to complete this Um this this podcast for you, but I did want to point out a couple things. Number one, um, when we started getting a barrage of information about um, the the NAR antitrust lawsuits, and you know, uh, for those of you who have been around for any any number of years, you know that I consistently said, you know, NAR is going to be in trouble about how we handle commission. Um, I've said, you know, I said in the past, you know, agents have called me and asked me questionable things. 
um, agents have said questionable things to me about, you know, what they were going to do in terms of my listing if they didn't feel like they were making enough money from my seller, um, all sorts of things over the years. And I think people really kind of took for granted that NAR um, was um, poised um, to make sure that um, we came out as professionals looking a certain way in that lawsuit. I think that um, now a lot of brokers uh, specifically are feeling a little slighted um, with NAR and betrayed because of how we got perceived um, as professionals um, in, the, in the court case. And um, just the way NAR handled um, the settlement and, you know, um, how things were going to, you know, roll out and what it meant for us and, you know, all of that. A lot of brokers, you know, feel like um, that NAR made us look bad. And so um, they are now taking, you know, their own um, kind of sort of, you know, drastic measures. Um, and so... Um, that I, I was just saying that um, to um, lead up to um, a story that has hit um, all the um, news media outlets um, that have to do with real estate. So you can find an um, article about it on uh, in the news. You can find um, information about it on the housing wire. I actually went to uh, nowbam.com because I am such an advocate for reading the actual court documents. Like if there's a big profile case um, and you can get access to, you know, the, the legal briefings or whatever to read what the gist of the um, lawsuit um, is, then I think that's great um, to be able to do that. So, um, what I'm talking about is a Pennsylvania real estate broker, Mr. Maurice Muhammad, um, has filed a lawsuit against the National Association of Realtors, the Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania Realtor Association, and its local MLS for requiring him to become a realtor to access the MLS. Now, um, I said that we were going to start seeing these um, lawsuits come from brokers as soon as the dust settled uh, between NAR and Sister Burnett and um, the moral case and all of that. Um, I've always kind of felt coerced to be a part of the National Association of Realtors. I will be totally and perfectly honest with you guys um, and let you know that if I felt like you guys could manage okay um, with um, not being a part of the MLS, I would drop it. Like I very seldomly um, use um, um, I guess such direct language um, to the entire brokerage, but I just think that um, it's important um, to say that that not every broker feels that they that their business can't move forward without them being affiliated with the National Association of Realtors. I was actually blessed to come and work with Mr. Larry Mayall after, you know, actually being signed up with several brokerages um, that required me to be a member of NAR, TAR, and MAR. Um, and while those uh, previous brokerages touted how great the organizations were, all I saw was my money being drained. Um, they didn't give me um, any options for lead generation, things like that. And so I feel like that should actually be a part of the real estate um, training is that they give you some sort of sales training. They do kind of make mention that, you know, you need to use your circle of influence. But once you, you know, run out of people in that, then where do you go? And so I actually... Um, was very um, disgruntled and was actually about to hang up my real estate license because I was paying all these fees 
Um, and no broker at the time or any of the previous brokers that I worked with, either they didn't have the desire to, to teach me what to do in order to generate um, leads um, or they uh, were too busy. And so I just felt like it was a big waste of money for me. I met Larry Mayall. He taught me how to navigate the world of real estate without having um, access to the National Association of Realtors. Um, and I actually did work as what they call a non-affiliated agent. Um, that's what we call a non-affiliated agents, NA agents here. Um, and I actually um, did very well um, working that way. Um, and so um, I um, was actually working very closely with another agent um, here. We were kind of a, we were kind of a team, and that agent was like, "Oh, you should be a member of you know Tar, you know Nar, and, and Mar because of all these benefits." And I'm like, "Well, I don't see any benefits, and I really wasn't going to do it." And so that person was like, well, I'm going to pay for it. And I'm like, well, if I don't have to pay for it, then fine, you know, because I didn't see any value in it really. And um, so, um, and, and just to caveat, a lot of people are like, well, probably thinking, well, you didn't see any value in having the MLS. And I'm going to say that um, Best Real Estate Company, um, we were before First National Realty and our fearless leader at the time had his own MLS. So I was totally comfortable with just using that. Um, and um, so this partner or person that I had teamed up with thought that that was uh, a necessary thing. And so uh, paid, you know, the first um, set of fees for me. And then, you know, the second set of fees he was just like, you know, you're on your own with it. So, um, you know, it turns out I, I got stuck paying for him the second time. And then there was a need for a realtor broker here in our office. And so I took on that role and had, and thus um, having to remain a part of um, the um, three boards here for Tennessee. And, and I don't, and I'm not trying to dis disparage um, the, those, those organizations, NAR, TAR, and MAR, you know, or the Northwest Mississippi Association of Realtors or anything like that. I think that um, if that's something that you want to do for whatever your reasons is, as it relates to business or just for being connected with other members in the industry is perfectly fine. I do think it should be a personal choice for every individual person though, because the broker has his own individual business like me. Um, the, I, I still sell houses and, and list houses just like you guys do. And um, I don't think your ability to be a realtor should be tied to whether or not I am a member. Um, I've always disagreed with that. And so Maurice Muhammad here is asking for uh, no less than $5.6 million in compensatory damages, along with punitive damages and seeking a permanent injunction requiring NAR, the Pennsylvania um, Realtor Association, and um, the, the GLBMLS to, number one, eliminate forced membership. Number two, restructure board governance to improve minority representation and to develop alternative MLS systems. So um, that was also um, a challenge here on our local board. I know some people probably don't want to hear me say this, but it was. And our National Association of um, National uh, Association of Real Estate Brokers, NARAB, actually had to have a, a, a round and about with NAR, uh, not NAR, but uh, well, NAR, but but MAR, our local board here in Memphis, um, about that uh, board governance um, and just how really the same people from the same brokerages, um, the same groups 
are uh, the people who typically are get these board positions and then they do what you know is 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 best you know based on different set of criteria um, and I don't know because I'm not really involved in that part of it. I, I really just go over there when they call me to say, hey, do you want the fees to go up? And I, you know, we want to raise the fees. What do you think? And I'm usually going to say, don't raise our fees. So um, in terms of the board um, governance and things of that nature, um, I do know that there was some going around about that a few years ago. And uh, NARAB um, was able to convince our local board um, to kind of restructure the board to improve minority representation. And I can say that um, since that conversation has been had, um, there are, I have seen a, a more diverse representation on our, our board. And then the last one is to develop alternative MLS systems. And that, that one is really big for me because I understand that um, people look at the MLS for two reasons. Number one, um, they're wanting to make sure that their aid, the other agents in the market can see the information for their listing, number two. Um, the only other reason that agents were really looking into more like the, the, well, there are lots of reasons, but the other main reason was to be able to see what the commission was going to be like on a particular property. Um, and that was all that people really saw. And I looked at the MLS and said, yes, those things are, are wonderful. Um, but I feel like the MLS is um, the way they're set up now. They are structured so that you're only getting a, um, a like um, just a limited view of what's happening in the market. I feel like if you're paying to be a member of the National Association of Realtors, you should be able to have some access to be able to see some information for all listings across the country, because as you know, um, through globalization um, and other things, um, we are actually um, getting to the point where, um, you know, things are um, smaller uh, for us than, um, Um, in terms of, of, of the world, like it's getting more closed in. So more and more people are um, being able to make connections and interact with one another. And I think that that um, says a lot. And so you should be able to see um, multiple um, things in your MLS and, and, the, and the ground that they cover should be wide. Which is why I wanted to, um, okay, I think I got it. Um, which is why I wanted to show you guys um, the um, access that I have in a few of our um, agents, um, our non um Um, okay, there we go. I wanted to be able to show you guys, uh, give you uh, access to see um, an option that we have. So this is my state MLS. Several of you have probably heard me talk about it before. You have seen me um, promote it probably um, before. And as you can see, this is well, this is my access. Um, in order to get access to this MLS um, uh, and get the discounts that best offers, you need to come through me to, to do that. Um, and um, this is, I love this MLS for one, because it's very uh, easy to navigate. As you can see, I've got one active listing in here. That's 8893 um, 
Lindstrom Drive, which is, and, and then you see all your listing addresses up here. So these other listings are um, listings that sold. Um, I've had six listings in here so far um, this year. You can do searches here. Um, it has a mortgage calculator. Um, it has an affinity with uh, other um, organizations. So like for one, we have a great um, relationship with the CE shop. They have a similar relationship with the CE shop so that you can get, um, you know, discounts on your continuing education and things of that nature. You can definitely create a CMS, uh, a CMA, I'm sorry, if you needed to do that. Um, and um, you can search for regional and local listings. Uh, you can also search uh, nationwide for property listings. And you can use the professional search tool included with the membership at no extra cost. Um, so over here, we've got different forms. I'm going to click on that. So like there's all different sorts of forms um, here that um, you can use. I use these forms pretty much in uh, my other states. Uh, uh, and as you can see, they have forms for every state. Um, I clicked in here before they may not be. Um, yeah, so if you click in here, you can see that there's the MAR contract. They have a Tennessee Association of Realtors Purchase and Sale Agreement. We're going to open that up. We're going to share this tab. And as you can see, this is the exact same purchase and sale agreement that uh, Mar and Tar give us. Okay. So this... Um, they do have access to that. Um, um, and, um, you know, it's our form, it's editable. Um, and, you know, it's, um, it's very interesting, you know, that, that you could get this. And then um, what kind of bothered me about it was at first was that you know, they would say, um, I'm going to go back and share back to um, what really bothered me once I got into um, the My State MLS. And I actually became a member of My State MLS because I have a real estate license as a broker. I'm a principal broker for our Missouri branch. Um, we do have um, an, a, a, an agent here who is also licensed in Missouri and so in order for that agent to be licensed, um, she's also a broker and an auctioneer. She needed a broker. Um, so I went there, took the test, um, did the things that I needed to do to require the broker license um, so that we could um, begin working in that area. And then we had an agent who actually was in, uh, in Missouri, um, um, living there. And so um, she became a broker at my urging. You know, I tell everybody, go get your broker license. And she also became an auctioneer for the state of, of, um, of um, Missouri. And when we were asking um, the, the, the people there, like, what forms do you use and this and that, what MLS, they, they gave us this information. And so as you can see, there is forms in here, see, for every state. Um, the other thing that I love um, is that they have IDX forms. So you can fill out an IDX form that's, uh, and, and, and uh, have um, the, an IDX feed from the My State MLS feed into your personal website. Um, if you go and um, you... See here, there's a link for best real estate company. Um, so this is where I can go and see all the agents who are signed up with best real estate company who are using this MLS and to be able to help them manage and navigate things. And then I have my very own um, page as an agent. Um, I tend to use my entire name when I'm not in um, the working um, in the state of Tennessee. 
uh, a lot of people, and I don't go by my first name because a lot of people mispronounce it. I know what it's what people think it is, but and even though my name is spelt that way, <laughs> the way most people pronounce it is not the way that um, is pronounced in my family and where I come from. And people just refuse to pronounce it the way that I grew up answering to it. So I just am not going to. Um, I just go by my nickname, which is Kay. Um, anyway, but if you wanted to uh, go and um, look at what uh, options they have for listings, see, we can add a listing, you can see your listing, you can print hot sheets and give them to um, other agents, you can email them, um, you can look at your company listings, you can look at any open houses, things of that nature. Um, like I said, you've got forms and resources, different marketing assets. Um, there is a CRM in here, which is awesome. Um, all of this comes as a part of it. Um, and then if you wanted to search, you can search the MLS listings. We're going to go to that. And I just want you to see, I can search Memphis, Tennessee. We'll see a few listings in here uh, for Memphis, Tennessee. I know this is active. This one's zero single. It's actually Singletary Parkway. Memphis, Tennessee, 38118. I actually know that it is available for sale because I drive by it um, on a regular basis going to see a family member. Bill Patton is a land professional. As you see, he's licensed to Tennessee and Mississippi. He um, um, is with uh, National Land Realty. And there's just in contact information down here, but he gives you all the property information you need about it. Um, I love that they give us so much space to describe our property. You don't get that um, in our local Tennessee MLS. Um, I love that you're able to get a FEMA flood map. They give you all the tax IDs. All of this stuff uh, comes up. Um, and it's been this one has been listed since March. Um, he gives you a slideshow, so you can just click on it real easy. You can, you know, drive by, um, I mean, not drive by, but look at the pictures. They come up really nice and big, depending on, you know, how you took your, your pictures um, and so forth and so on. So you can contact the agent, request a showing, report a problem. You can share the listing um, with someone. Um, you can look at the history of, on the listing, the listing history and the price. If you wanted to look at it on a Google map, you could. Um, you can add this listing to a cart. You can add it to a CMA. You can track the listing to see when it goes under contract and things of that nature. And they give you all sorts of layouts. So like for those of you who understand that, you know, when you're showing properties and you're getting the information out of the MLS, Memphis Area Association of Realtors, or the Northwest Tennessee, I mean, Northwest Mississippi Association of Realtors, you can print those little sheets to give to your buyer. So you can do the same thing here. I just wanted to point that out and it looks so much better. Uh, maybe I can. So this is kind of what you would get kind of look like this. You can like it or love it and then add it to a favorite. You can share it to Facebook, X, LinkedIn, Pinterest, or WhatsApp over here. I mean, it's just a very, it's a much more robust uh, M, uh, MLS. Also, the other thing that I wanted to point out to you is not only can I look at properties in Tennessee, but I can look at properties in New York if I wanted. If they had, um, if there's a certain type of listing, um, I can just search by uh, city. It's going to come up here in a minute. Um, my computer's moving a little slow, but if you notice, there we go. Um, so this property is active for sale, Park Avenue, uh, 400 Park Avenue South. Um, it's in New York, New York. I can see the price of it. I can see that somebody dropped the price on it. $500,000. I can click on it and get the same information um, 
and then go to the next uh, to the next one, so so forth and so on. I can request more showings. Um, I can um, uh, request to co-broker this with the person um, and, and whatnot. The other thing that's great, and I'm going to go out of here now, I just want to kind of show you guys that you could do all these things with this MLS, and you can do it up from Memphis to New York, uh, which is something we can't do with any of the local MLSs that we have, which are um, set up um, and operated by our, um, which are set up and operated by our, um, our local boards. The other thing um, that I wanted to point out is that um, because that particular MLS is not a MLS that is um, owned, operated, managed by the National Association of Realtors, we can still, let me go back to it, I might be able to show you, we can still um, list our, uh, the commission um, what we're going to pay the um, other agent um, in our uh, MLS. So let me go back over here. We're going to share one more time if I can get back on. Okay, so we're back to sharing. So this is my listing. You can see that the listing has been viewed 198 times on here. Um, so that doesn't include the list, the times it's been viewed in the um, MAR MLS. As you can see on my listing over here, they gave us the right, um, the, all the same information. I didn't go to FEMA and get a fluid map. They put that there. You can see the last price that I had listed for um, what um, type of listing I have. Is it shared in the MLS? Is it active for sale? All the things. Um, and then you see I've got all the marketing here. I'm showing that there is open houses, um, which th that information is actually being pulled from Zillow. Um, I have the client's contact information in here, which um, no one um, that is, this is my listing, so no one is getting this information um, if I'm sending them like one of the comp sheets or whatever. Um, they're not seeing my client's information. You're seeing it because my clients are actually, um, this is actually my listing to edit. And so, as you can see, I'm, I'm telling you all this great information in here. A lot of it's just, uh, it's just populated from public record. Um, as you can see, I have a listing date that it expires, the date that I listed it, and you can see the commission. So down here is showing you where it's feeding to. So I want to point out to you guys, it's feeding to listhubrealtor.com, which is the, um, which is, um, the portal for the National Association of Realtors, Zillow, Trulia, Home Finder, Homes, Property Star, Localized City, all of these places is where it's, is where it's feeding. Um, and um, so that's very much, that's a lot more information that you get on um, here just by looking at your own listings. It's right in front of you than what you would get um, in our local MLS. It's very easy to, to, uh, to come about um, and, and, and use. So we're gonna stop sharing that. And so I wanted you to know that. Um, I'm not really sure what's gonna happen um, with, this, with this lawsuit if, and, and what's gonna come of it. Um, there is, like I said, you can go to nowbam.com and search for the uh, for the article broker files 5.6 million dollar lawsuit against NAR um, over MLS access requirements. Um, I'm gonna uh, 
let's see, do I guess go back? Well, I can't really show it to you from here. That's what it was. Okay, so yeah, you can go there and you can read more about this. Um, and that's really important. They actually have a copy of the complaint that um, that the uh, broker filed. And I think we're going to see uh, some more of this. I actually saw, did see uh, a couple of other stories um, where that was the case. There is an opinion in the Inman News, um, and it came out in September, um, and the opinion is uh, was written by a Massachusetts broker named Nadine Heiser. Um, who outlines the differences between non-affiliated brokers and independents like her and why her company, Key Realty Group, made the choice to leave NAR. Uh, so that's what her opinion, article, the article starts out saying is, I'm a real estate broker, but I'm no longer a realtor, and here's why. And she gave her reasons uh, for, for doing so. So that's interesting. Um, information um, as well. Um, I also wanted to uh, point out that um, in our Realtor Magazine, I'm not sure if you guys are getting at that online or not, but in our Realtor Magazine, um, there is a nice article that it actually came out a couple days ago, October 22nd, and it's called Back to Basics, How to Develop a Training Plan. Um, and so um, I think if you are someone who is looking to build a team, um, this is a great article uh, for you to um, read where you can start um, doing that because we all know that um, the speed of the leader is the speed of the game and our team is only as strong as its weakest link. <clears throat> the other thing that I wanted to... Um, do was point out that there is a lot of information out here now about uh, training and um, how to uh, training and how to build your business plans and things for the for the next year. As you guys know, I'm not sure which podcast has been a couple, at least two ago. I told you that I use the month of October to think about the the, uh, the the plans that I laid out for this year. Um, I review any challenges and obstacles that I've had, things that would, um, would um, have been challenges and in, in in, in having me to complete some of my um, things on my to-do list of my plan. Um, and then I also take that time, same time, to celebrate some of the um, successes that I've had as well. And so if you guys are looking for a really simple business plan that you can use to kind of, you know, plan out a uh, plan out your um, your goals for next year, let me know. I do have um, some copies of some plans um, in our new agent learn. Well, I don't want to call it a new agent, but in our agent learning database. Um, and so you can use some of those. Um, there is another website called the Paperless Agent that I really, really like. Um, and it is a site that comes highly recommended by the National Association of Realtors. They give a lot of new uh, and interesting uh, um, uh, materials. Um, they usually have um, each year a... Um, a, a business plan that's simple to follow that you can download for free. Um, so if you guys um, need help next week or in the week, coming weeks trying to figure out how to access um, that kind of um, tool, let me know. But it's very easy to do. Um, and uh, if, you're, if you keep up with this podcast, you can always just come back and rewind and get to the part where I'm telling you right now that uh, the paperless agent, um, that's paperless agent, P-A-P-E-R-L-E-S-S agent.com has, usually has free and downloadable tools that you can use uh, for that. Um, and um, we also have one in our um, agent learning database. So if you guys want to be um, looking for that, then you can. 
And then the final thing that I wanted to talk about was that um, TD Bank, so a lot of people understand what TD Ameritrade is, I'm sure. It's uh, it's kind of like a um, an investment house. They help you to invest in stocks and things of that nature. Most people know what TD Ameritrade is. They had commercials a few years ago where they were really touting that name of their business. Uh, but they are a subsidiary. TD Ameritrade, I believe, is a subsidiary of TD uh, Bank Group. And um, TD Bank just pled guilty last week um, to charges um, of um, money laundering. Like that, it, well, they weren't money, they weren't laundering money. They, they failed to have specific regulations and processes in place to prevent the laundering of money through their bank uh, from, you know, um, Chinese um, cartel or drug lords. Um, and and um, they actually, uh, they, they pled guilty to settle the charges um, and um, they issued a combined, and then the federal government issued a combined um, $315 billion in fines to um, TD Bank. Um, it is the largest fine of its kind in history. Um, the If you listen to the um, Department of Justice, because that's where I got this information from last week, I'm reading from... Um, this week's um, Memphis Business Journal. So I, I do want to show you guys what I'm getting today's um, information from. But I actually saw this last week and was planning on talking about it. So I'm happy I got my um, my um, Business Journal and they have a big write-up in here about it. Um, and so basically, these uh, it, it was very easy to get a bank account. Um, if you were uh, fitting certain criteria with TD Bank and they were very relaxed in their practices um, when it came to regulation and reporting. Um, and so that's why they got that big, huge fine. Um, TD Bank is actually headquartered out of New Jersey um, and it's also subject to an asset cap now of $434 billion um, in its total assets. Um, and, and this limit does not apply to the TD Securities or any of the bank's Canadian or other global businesses. So it does not affect your TD Ameritrade. Um, the OCC said that the cap will remain in place until um, TD Bank achieves compliance with all actionable items in its order. Um, and the reason that this made it to the Memphis Business Journal was because TD Bank unsuccessfully attempted to acquire Memphis's First Horizon Corp. Um, and they were, that action was um, interceded um, because of all of this other um, activity, if you will, that was going on. Um, and then, so that's something interesting. Um, you know, um, to keep up with, I'm not really sure what the structure, what the restructuring is going to look like. But if you guys are doing any business with TD Bank, uh, TD Ameritrade, or any of its affiliates, you probably want to reach out to whomever you um, speak to there to get the gist of how um, that activity and the things that they're having to do as a result of that activity could affect future investments for you. And the final thing that I wanted to point out was that um, XAI leases another three, another 550 acres um, of land near the supercomputer site. So if, for those of you who don't know, the XAI is the big, huge computer that Elon Musk has brought um, to our area. And um, he's actually there in the process of leasing another 550 acres um, located at 3231 Paul R. Lowry Road, Lowry um, Road. And this is um, the, the part that got me. So the deal is going to start as a lease. At least. No rent will be charged for the first year. 
and then rent will be set at 1.65 million starting in the second year with a 2.5% annual increase each year thereafter. Um, so after 21 years, the lease could be extended with two more 10 year terms or in the 22nd year, the company would have the option to purchase the property as is for 23.6 million, according to a letter of intent. So, um, this question is for my commercial um, agents out there. You know who you are. Um, so, 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 this XAI company or the company that own, um, that owns X, the XAI um, supercomputer, which is really Elon Musk, um, one of the richest people, you know, in our. Um, world um, and his company they're getting to be able to lease all this land uh, free of charge uh, for the first year and then they're they're set for 1.65 million dollars for rent starting in the second year um, Oh, sorry about that. So um, what I want to know from our commercial, one of our commercial agents is how does that, if you, if you take this article and if you want you can come in and talk to me, I'll give you um, the article and we can go through all the numbers that they have here. They have a bunch of numbers here, but I would love to have a commercial real estate agent on the show to talk to us about the deal that, um, um, XI, XAI got uh, from Memphis in terms of being able to use the building for Electrolux and to be able to expand um, to um, use um, that extra land for battery storage. Um, this deal that they set up, how uh, effective um, is, is that deal and um, will, will it be in maintaining a um, relationship beyond the initial 20 years with Memphis and what does our uh, revenue, I mean, what is a, 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 a contract like that actually work to the city? Like if they were to carry it out and go through the 20 something years and pay 1.65 million per year, as well as um, being able to use that um, other space, what does that equal out to look like um, in terms of revenue that that company is spending? And um, how could this possibly benefit um, our local citizens? Because one of the other things that the article says is that um, they have, um, XAI has also reached out to uh, MLG and W, um, they're looking to be able to acquire so much water and so much electric power on a consistent basis from MLGNW. And I would just love to know if one of our agents can help us determine the impact um, of that. Like, does that make our electric uh, bills go up or down um, this uh, deal that they have together? And I think that's all that I have today. I am very appreciative for you guys um, to continue to uh, support the podcast. Uh, like I said, I am working on doing some things different. Um, you guys are going to get a survey in November um, where I'm asking you questions about what you thought about this podcast and other things that we've tried to do. Um, and we don't want to be wasting um, your time and we don't want to um, be giving you things that you don't find value and so I'm, I'm looking very much forward to um, reading the survey responses and like I said if you guys want any other information about my state in the last if you're um, looking to uh, get a business plan where you can write down uh, some of the things that you want to accomplish for next year as it relates to your business, uh, please let me know. I'll be happy to um, help you to 
get on the right path for that. And also, I encourage everyone this month um, to um, really focus on um, finding out some information about another niche in our um, in our field. I um, have been working um, off and on here, not as consistently as I would like, on um, a um, transition to business brokerage um, because I um, am, you know, very much interested in, um, you know, taking my business to a, in a different direction. I want to learn something new um, and have a different set of challenges. After a while, selling homes, even though each situation is different, the way that you solve the challenges, uh, pretty much, they're pretty consistent. And so I just thought, you know, let's learn something new and let's let's do something new. So um, I have definitely done that, um, not just with real estate, but with some other things in my life. And I'm really excited about it. And so, you know, I urge you guys to do that. Become avid um, become serious about the education that you give yourself in terms of real estate. Um, it's only going to make you better. And I know people have a lot going on. A lot of people say they don't have time to read a lot. Um, they, but you can listen to podcasts. Um, I, you know, oftentimes hear agents say, I can't make it to this, but then I'll pull up a Facebook page and, you know, they made it to this other thing that was more entertaining. There's nothing wrong with that. But I just think that um, the same standard that, you know, um, you would expect someone to have um, in terms of their knowledge and understanding about their job when you are being served as the customer or client is, is what you want to auto project to the people who are considering you the expert. Um, and they are working and operating in a capacity as your customer and client. Um, I've always said, you know, I'm never, I'm probably never going to be that overly flashy agent with, you know, makeup on every day and, you know, um, really big expensive shoes and a handbag. That's not going to be me. Um, those things I don't really value. Um, that's not going to make me do business with someone or not. Not to say that you need to be totally like disorganized and you know, out of control. Absolutely not. I'm just saying um, what a person is, um, how expensive a person looks is just never a question for me. So um, I want you guys to think about that, um, how, you know, how um, you are coming off to your clients in terms of, you know, the level of knowledge that you have. And if you guys want me to help out and uh, on an individual basis, helping you to, you know, figure out different things that you can listen to or read that will keep you attuned. Um, I'm happy to do that. Uh, and I'm, you know, very thankful that we are all in this boat together and that we can, you know, depend on each other and lean on each other to uh, be, get sharpened, you know, iron sharpens iron. And so with that being said, I'd like to thank you guys so much for um, sticking with me today um, and for um, hearing me out. And like I said, next week we'll go into some trainings about, you know, how we can um, sustain ourselves and still be getting leads in the, in the uh, um, anticipating, you know, slowing down of our markets because of the holiday season. And um, I hope that you all are, you know, gearing up to have a very positive and exciting weekend. I'm probably going to be taking a rest this weekend, which is typically what I'm doing anyway, but that's my excitement. And um, until next time, take care of yourselves and sell something. Bye-bye.